is to be encouraged, to hear what God's doing in each other's life, to go forth, do work in the kingdom, but to be encouraged. Now, here's the caution. is to leave it in this place when tomorrow hits you with tomorrow's struggles. Is to leave the encouragement that we felt here, right here where we found it, and let tomorrow be bigger than what we're doing together tonight. So, I'll be honest, I kind of set you up for tonight. Because of all the Beatitudes, these last couple, they are going to be tough. And they're speaking to Christians. So if, I feel like all of them are, but these for sure are because of the words that Jesus says. And and so um, we've titled this message, Don't Keep the Peace. And I'll further explain that. But of all these... I can promise you, and if this hits you, um, just work it out with God, that this is one of the tougher, if not the toughest, to do. And so let the scripture do what it should do to your heart on this subject instead of saying, well, I got this under hand. And so... Um, I'll just cut right to the chase. If we're to be peacemakers, there's just one way we're going to do it. And what do you think that way is going to be? Jesus. Absolutely. And so last week we talked about being pure in heart for they shall see God. And the only way that we were going to be pure in heart is if we're seeking after. Jesus. Absolutely. So here we go. What's the difference? Hear people say, I just try to keep the peace. And so I want to go ahead and just let's get this out of the way. Keeping the peace is not the same as bringing peace to a situation. So let's see. Let's read it together. And then we'll get into this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed, happy, are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now listen, Jesus does not say blessed are those that keep the peace. Blessed are those that retain peace. He did not even say blessed are those that have peace. This is offensive. You're going to have to do work for this to be Relevant in your heart. The difference in keeping the peace and being a peacemaker is that in keeping the peace, peace already exists in the situation that you're in. Yes, you should do that. To be a peacemaker means to come in a violent and non-peaceful situation and bring peace with you. There's a big difference in that. Well, I don't, I just try not to rock the boat. Good for you. Do you head in when the boat's already rocking and give peace? That's the difference. That's a major difference. And that's what he's called all of us to. To not just keep peace, but to bring peace with us into the situations. I couldn't help in studying, but just think about the time the disciples are on the boat. Right? And Jesus is about as peaceful as you get. If you've never been asleep on the water or by the water, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But if you've ever just taken a really good nap or fell asleep on the water, staring at the water right next to the water, man, that's peace. At least for me it is. Jesus just... They need Him. And as Jesus stares down the wind and the waves, what does He say? peace. Be still. To bring peace into the situation. To not just exist in peace, but to bring it with you. Man, that's a whole different ball game. Now, 
You say, well, how could I possibly do that? I'm glad you asked. We're going to get to that. But to say there's not a space for that in our world, you have to be living under a rock. You can't go to the store. You can't have a conversation. If you talk to two people, one of those people, I can promise you, needs some peace brought into whatever's going on. Man, we got about as much going on in today's world as you could ask for that needs peace brought to it. And as I see things in our world just continue to grow and grow and grow, I cannot be mad at the legislative branch. I can't be mad at our government. I can't be mad at non-Christians. Because as we've made our way through the Sermon on the Mount, if these things were exhibited in the life of Christians and in the life of the church, then our communities would look different. Completely different. This, by and large, is non-existent. Matter of fact, as the church, mostly, we've engaged in rocking the boat rather than peacemaking. Now, before we head into this, I, I don't, I want to show you a couple of different things about peace because all religions kind of speak about finding inner peace and what peace is. What is this? And representing what? Peace. From what? What is it taken from? Say it loud and proud. Noah's Ark. You're kind of unsure. You're like, mm, I don't want to be wrong in church. Noah's Ark. Next one. Oh, more common. Oh, we like wearing this one. All things in balance, right? Crap. That's what it is. Okay? It's crap. That's what you can refer to this as. There's not a little bit of bad in all good, and there's not a little bit of good in all bad. That's ridiculousness. It's not keeping balance. We serve a completely holy and righteous God in whom there is no dark. But it's a symbol of peace in our world. Last but certainly not least, our favorite symbol, peace. Right, there was a whole generation that was built out of this. Okay? Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Woodstock was literally built on this. Y'all don't know, I don't have time to get into that. But listen, there was, there was a growing desire within people because of the way the world looked around them that they wanted peace. Now, they went about it completely wrong. And they're still scarred today from the choices they made during that time period. But there was a desire for peace in their world. That everything was such a mess that we want to abandon the world that we're in right now and find peace. Now that's only partially right. Because as Christians, we have that peace and we are to take it into the situations. We're to make a difference with that peace. Now, yes, we carry the gospel forward. But even in an unbelieving world, we are to be the ones that bridge the gap to make peace. And yet, I find as the church that we're choosing sides and engaging in the battle instead of being peacemakers. Now, I'm not talking about this uh, spirituality that's just on this journey for peace and all things are calm in my world. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actually bringing peace to a situation. I'm not talking about something unattainable. I'm talking about actually bringing peace. This side's mad. This side's mad. How can I bring peace into this? There's a problem in this situation. How do I insert peace into this situation? Maybe I'm even involved in it and the other party is visibly upset. How do I interject peace into this? 
Because what Jesus says, now listen very clearly before we get into what peace is or isn't and how we get there. They shall be called sons of God. Now hear me, we're not talking about some kind of Eastern mysticism. Not telling you that once you find your inner peace, then you will be a son of God. Being a peacemaker does not make you a son of God. It's still through grace, through Christ alone. Not that you be a peacemaker and you get to be a son of God, but rather by your peacemaking, you are known as a son of God. Now we have to do a little bit of work on this so ladies don't get upset at me. We're very quick to interject what doesn't just mean son of God. It means all people in most cases. There's a reason this word is used. To be the son meant that you would be the heir. You get that? To be a son of God meant that you would be an heir. So this promise is more than a title. It's more than you just get to be called a son of God. But rather you are called the heir as Paul tells us, to share in the inheritance of God. That's a, that's a big promise. That's more than just getting to be called a son of God, but to be called an heir and to share in the inheritance of God. So how are we going to get to being peacemakers? There's not very many of us that are wired to head into an unstable situation to bring peace unless it's concerning us. Most of us are like, oh, they're about to fight. About to get my phone out. <laughs> We're just not naturally wired to say, I need to bring peace to this situation. Rather, let me let this play out. I'm going to stay removed from it. This is already a very high tension situation. I couldn't do anything to help it. But yet Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. So as we have every week, it's going to take all these other things building in your life. I'm just going to tell you, love you to death. You miss one of these first eight that we've gotten to, you'll never make it to being a peacemaker. Ever. If you're not poor in spirit, no way. Because you'll think of yourself more highly than the situation and you'll bypass it. If you're not okay being in mourning so that comfort could come, how are you going to cry with those that need to cry? Meek? If you're ready to meet force with force every time a situation arises, that's definitely not going to be peaceful. If you're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness, why would you want to bring peace in anybody else's life? If your heart's not pure for the things of the kingdom, you definitely don't want to bring peace. Why would you want to bring peace? You want to pick sides. If you're not willing to show mercy, you definitely don't want to see somebody else have peace. So as we build to all these things, this is our checklist to get going. To be called a son of God, to share in the inheritance. It's to be a peacemaker. Let's look at what peace isn't. Matthew 23. I just love how these stack up together. It's absolutely beautiful. What do you... What's the opposite of peace? War. War. Violence. Chaos. Chaos. Unrest. Pandemonium. Now we're just naming as many words as we can possibly name. We got them. We got it. What did the Pharisees love to stir up in the people? 
Absolutely. Woe to you, verse 29, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our father, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Sounds pretty violent. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. I don't know how many of you have ever been around vipers, but they're not very peaceful. How are you doing to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. That doesn't sound peaceful, does it? It sounds very, very violent. And yet this was the leaders of the day. They had taken what they'd known about the scriptures and they used it to self-righteously make right the violence and the hatred that they had. They used it to make okay what they held in their hearts for people that did not act like them. There was no peacemaking with the Pharisees. Never. But yet Jesus tells us, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be the sons of God. Unfortunately, what we found ourselves in the midst of is exactly what Jesus is saying, woe to the Pharisees for. Cursed be to you because you institute this. We can take a stance and hear me very well, please. And we're going to get into Ephesians in just a little bit. But we can take stances as the church that are rooted in truth, but also for personal gain in a way to which we go after people, not in a way to make peace, but to make war and violence. We can take groups that we want to pick on and stand on our morals in Scripture and not go after them in love and in hopes to make peace so they see Jesus, but in a way to make war with them. And we rest on our morals saying, should not act like this because they're sinners. Lest you forget, while you were a sinner, God first loved you. That's why this is in here. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be representatives of God. I'm not saying we don't make a stance, but how do we make a stance in love and bring peace? Say, what does that look like? Just go through the Gospels. Look at Jesus. They come to Him wanting to institute him to be on one side or the other. Should we pay taxes to this wrong, wrong emperor we got? And what's Jesus' answer? Give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what's God's. Peacemaking. Understand the situation. The Roman Empire could kill anyone they felt like killing at any time. And yet Jesus was trying to institute peace in that relationship. We've gotten to a point where we take the precious words of God and we pick and choose which ones we want to stand on. And instead of them creating peace in the world that needs it, we create more division with it. And you're wrong and you're wrong. And I'm right. Because Jesus said so. But would he have said it that way? Would he have acted like that? 
No, he brought peace into every situation. And that's the call for us. This is why I say we can't merely keep the peace, but we have to aggressively go after making peace in unpeaceful situations. Jesus constantly stepped on the hornet's nest and then began to insert peace in that situation. To be a peacemaker. For us, we like to just kick the hornet's nest and then run away. Say, well, I can do that. Proverbs 16. We're really going to have to do some work on this. And listen, all of these things are contingent on one thing. That you actually want to see God and be a son of God. You will not go after these things if your heart does not want that. Trust me. Proverbs 16. And this is just a checklist for those of you that are saying, I'm doing pretty good at this. All right, let's talk. Proverbs says this. When a man's ways, verse 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, He makes even his what? Enemies to be at peace with him. That's what being a peacemaker looks like. Yeah, I got some enemies. But they're at peace with me. It's okay. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with Him. This is what Jesus is going to say, and we're going to get into it next week. But at the end of the chapter, that He's going to say, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. That's that's going to take a lot of peacemaking. Because if you slap me, I'm probably going to throw hands. But this is what Jesus has called us to. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. He's going to go on to say, even those that persecute you, love them and pray for them. Peacemaking so that you will be called a son of God. Man, if there was ever a time that the world needed the church to be involved in this and look like Jesus, it's now. To not take a stance on this and do it out of hatred. We're fine taking a stance if it's rooted in Scripture, but to do it in love in a way that creates peace. One of the biggest things that's going to have to happen if we're to be peacemakers is we're going to have to swallow our pride. Because that's what gets in the way of peacemaking. We're going to have to swallow ourselves a little bit And not choose sides, but rather be after peace. How do I get that? John 14, if I told you that you already have it, but it's up to you to use it, And that begs the question, why are we not? If you profess to follow Jesus, then you already have it. John 14, this 
promise. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. Verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. What's the next word? Peace I leave with you. Whose peace? My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let, your, let not your hearts be troubled. So that's something already passed on to the Christian. It's peace. Now, if we're not being peacemakers with peace, we are freely given. What does that make us? Ooh, you're not going to like this answer. Selfish. So peace I leave with you. My peace. For us to not pass that on, it makes us what? How can you get something free and not turn around and hand it back out? Peace. A Christian changed with the Holy Spirit living inside of them should not only exhibit peace in their life, but be actively engaged, not in strife and quarreling amongst people, but engaged in peacemaking at every opportunity. So that's an awful high standard. It's not mine, it's Jesus's. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. If that peace is truly in you, you'll know a tree by its fruits, right? And the fruit of the Spirit, guess what's right in the middle of it? Peace. So a Christian should be marked by actively engaging peacemaking. My, how that's so overlooked. As Christians, to be bringing peace into every situation. Shoot, inside the walls we have a hard time doing that. Jesus is calling us to get this right so we can go get that right. To bring peace to a world who has no peace. But yet was freely deposited in us. So what does peace really look like? Somebody tell me, what your peace looks like. What is peace for you? For, for my mother right here, peace for her is absolutely no noise, mountain monsters on the TV, and fresh brewed coffee in her hand, perhaps a slice of lemon cake. That's peace. What's, what's peace for you? Everybody's got their thing. What's peace? We won't judge in here. Do they have to be doing like this or? Okay. All right. Oddly specific. What's peace for you? Full bed. You should be very peaceful. What does your peace look like? What is it? What's the place? What's the time? What's the situation? That's peace. Y'all need to work on your peace spots. Peace. Watching the sunsets. Watching the sunrises. Peace. It's also good on your dating profile. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh. Peace. Come on, everybody's got it. Yes. The beach reading your Bible? Peace. <laughs> what else? What's peace for you? Peace. Everything's really clean. No, I get it. Peace. I think for me, it's just being surrounded by people who I know love me. It's just that, like, you have no worries. Like, there's nothing to care about. Peace. Peace. Listen, and, and to be honest, we go to great lengths sometimes to get to that. Like we'll do whatever. Like I, I just I just need to get here so I can feel it. And listen, there's a world out there that doesn't know peace like we should know peace as Christians. That peace of knowing, come whatever may, that we got a God that's got our back. That's peace. That this life isn't it for us. That should be peace. And there's a world that needs peace interjected into it that we have. But sometimes we think that peace is the absence of chaos. That's not absolutely true. That's allowing the surroundings to dictate. There's a story told of a king who asked for the most peaceful painting in, in all the kingdom. And, and that artist will be just rewarded immensely. And as all of them are turned in, everybody's attention is on this one of a beautiful scene, kind of like what Josh described. Just clear water, mountains off the reflection. I even think it said there were some clouds doing like this. And everybody's vote was on this one. And yet the painting that wins was completely opposite. The painting was that of a storm brewing in the clouds, awful, choppy water, winds blowing through the mountain. But right dead center in the middle of this painting, there was one little bush coming out from the mountain. And there was a nest and a mama bird sitting on her egg, completely peaceful in the face of the storm. And that's the painting that won. And as the king describes why, he says, because that bird was completely at peace. That's the picture of peace. When we think that when we're at peace, it means there's nothing else swirling around. But that's not what peace is. There's going to be a ton of things swirling around. Probably always. But peace is knowing exactly where you're planted. And that there's a God in control of your life. And that every step and every move made, He knows about it. He's got you. That it's not that the skies will always be clear, but in the midst of the storm, you can have peace. And that's the peace that He says, I leave you. Think about that. He tells them this right before He heads to the cross. Hours. Hours before you're on the run, my peace I leave to you. That's what he's asking us to go make in the world. 
is the peace that you feel. The peace that you've been given for me. Go take it out. In the midst of the argument, in the midst of people arguing about this side and that side and right, wrong, this decision, that decision, a Christian should be in the middle of it making peace. That's our role. That's what he's called us to do is to make peace. So how? What does that look like? Yes, we're on board. We want to be peacemakers. Ephesians 4 is probably best for us. Now listen, before before we go through this, I just want to say this as we're going to get ready to close. I just want to say this. Absent Absent of the Holy Spirit. You can take this however you want. Absent of the Holy Spirit, you will not exhibit peace in your life, nor will you come close to being a peacemaker. So if, if that's not true in your life, if that's not real in your life, it's going to be exhibited by the lack of peace and peacemaking in your life. And it's not something you can attain to. Because it's against everything in us humanly to want to be peacemakers. The only time we want to be peacemakers is in our own life. We don't want to go interject peace into other people's life. We'll just let them deal with what they got to deal with. And so short of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will not be a peacemaker. So Paul says this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you have been called. That calling is sons of God. Don't don't get that all messed up and think that's just for teachers or pastors. Sons of God. With all, what's the first word? Humility. Oh, that stinks. And gentleness with, this is our favorite P word. Oof, just right off the bat, I got to be humble, gentle, and patient. Bearing with one another in what? Love. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of eager to remain in unity in the bond of peace. Now, Paul's just talking about to the church. We even got to the outside world. He's just talking to the church to bear with one another in love. Eager to have peace rather than division. When's the last time you can say you were eager for unity and peace? Rather than let them do what they want to do and I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do me, let them do them. No, but rather be eager for us to remain in unity for peace. But did you see the three things that needed to be present before that? Humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another in love. There is one body and one spirit just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now listen, this is the reminder. Say fine. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. You know what he sums up and says? Why you should do all this? Why you should keep unity? Why you should be eager to do it? Because you received something that you didn't deserve in grace because of Christ's gift. And so the person that you have a problem with received it the same way you received it unworthy of it. So while Paul says we should be eager, you have to remember what you've been 
given. If you're going to maintain unity, you can't think highly of yourself and not highly of someone else. Because you didn't deserve grace when you were given grace. Now they're given grace. And this is just within us, this body, the body of the church, the next church down the road, to remain in unity and eager to do so in order for us to then carry peace out to the world that needs us to make peace. The reason Paul says with humility, gentleness, and patience is because people are going to make you mad. Amen? People are... This is... This makes me smile, but this is truth. People are going to be wrong. People are going to be wrong. And you're going to be right. And you're going to have a choice. Do I bring some peace into the situation? Or not humbly, do I need to be right for the sake of being right? That we're to speak the truth in what? And that's what we've forgotten about being peacemakers. So what, they're wrong, you're right. Does it really matter in the grand scheme of things? I'm not talking about scripturally things that we need to stand on and plant our flag on. You'd be right about those things, but you still better do it with love. What does it matter? Pretty much everything else outside of Scripture, what does it matter? To be a peacemaker. To bring peace into a situation. For people to say, how can you have that kind of peace? Why do you want to make peace? Because God called me to. I have peace because I know when all this is over and done, we're going to be in heaven. I laugh sometimes at one denomination that hates the other denomination that hates the other denomination. Because look, I'm not denying that some of them are probably saved. Man, heaven's going to be wild. <laughs> like, dang, the Methodists actually made it. It's going to be crazy. Because we haven't been peacemakers. We've been part of the division. I mean, there's a world out there that's going to have something new tomorrow morning to fight about. There's going to be a new topic that's going to cause division. And in the midst of all that, where we're getting ready to head is the city set on a hill, the salt and light of the world that should be bringing peace into those situations. To be peacemakers. Far too long have we just been okay with keeping the peace amongst our own. Far too long we've been okay with that. Instead of taking peace to people that need it. Finding the situation. When's the last time you looked for an unstable situation to bring peace into it? The peace that God has given you. But that's what he's called us to do, is to be peacemakers. So as, as we get ready to pray, listen. Want the word of God to open up your heart wide. Maybe you have peace, and maybe you're really good at staying in that peace. But are you striving to make peace in unpeaceful situations? Because that's a lot harder. To not lay down what you know is right, but to bring peace. To speak truth to people, but do it in a way to bring peace and comfort to them. Not in a way to be violent towards them. Because that's what our call is as Christians. To be sons of God, to be heirs to be, represent, to be representative of Jesus. To be peacemakers. So if you've accepted the call, you don't get the option. Go make peace. Go bring peace into situations. Let's pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the peace that you have given us. God, thank you for the peace that you put inside of your children. But God, forgive us for where we don't want to hand that peace back out to people. God, I pray that you would just stir up in us a desire to make peace. God, to not use your word, your truth as a way to cause division, as a way to be arrogant or proud, God. Let us always use your word in a, in a manner to create peace, to make peace. God, I pray that you keep the spirit of unity within this body and within your church universally so that, God, we can carry it out to a world in complete chaos. And, God, even as things begin to swirl in our own life, in our own world, God, I pray that we would have peace. God, I pray that we would just start right here among each other and carry peace to each other. God, to make peace among the body that you've put us in. So God, I pray that you would just work on our hearts about this. And God, it wouldn't be enough just to remain in peaceful situations. But God, that we're actively seeking to bring peace. And God, I pray that as we do that, that you will open the door for the gospel to go forward. That, God, you would strengthen us to look for these situations so that we could be the mouthpiece of what you want us to say to people. So, God, and I thank you. Thank you for this. God, I pray that it's been convicting to our hearts. But, God, I pray that we're also encouraged that you freely give us grace and that you give us peace through the Holy Spirit. God, thank you. Um, just for what you're going to do in the hearts of your people. And God, I pray that we go out this week and, and just look for opportunities to be peacemakers. God, give us the strength and the courage to seek out those situations so that we may bring peace into them. And God, we ask all these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.